All right, everybody, this is Ross the Fig Boss. In today's video, we are inside right now because I had probably one of the most amazing fig tastings of my life. And I wanted to really do this tasting and this video justice because I needed some time to reflect on what I had eaten. Um, I also got some more information from the grower, David Burke, who actually sent me these particular figs. They're, by the way, um, California grown seedlings. These are wild seedlings that David has found that are also caprified. And I have learned so much from David after this experience. Um, and I was, of course, blown away. I was so dumbfounded by this experience that I honestly didn't even know what to say about some of the figs that I was eating. It seemed like some of the flavors, uh, the experience was just so ridiculous that I was like at a loss for words. It's like I had never done uh, a fig video before. Um, to give you guys a little bit of the background, first, we're going to talk about David and what he's doing and his family. Uh, we're also going to talk about um, a little bit on just all the seedlings and also kind of a little bit of the figs that I'm even finding here in the Northeast and talk a bit about that and how that's really important. And then we're going to go through this tasting that we did and look at some of the really special varieties that he sent me. He sent me 10 different varieties actually in the mail. His wife had packed them up really nice. They came with this note. Um, each fig, by the way, has a number and they have some of them have a name here. One of them is new that has an it's an unknown unnamed new fine. So all it has really is a number and I'm going to put this down in the description. By the way, if you're interested in what David's doing, check out his website. It's called the fighunter.shop. I'll also put that down in the description. I do really thank David again. I really do. I'm so grateful for him and his family for doing this. His wife packed these up beautifully. Um it's very interesting how they did this, and I do think that there's going to be a market for something like this. This is, I really wish that I could do something like this as well, and that he basically got himself a food container of some kind um, that was obviously sealed. I think it was made of plastic, filled it up with um, shredded cardboard, and then also in the package itself was some of those uh, packets that freeze, and they're like that gel, and they stay cool for a longer period of time and uh he shipped it overnight with ups and i think i don't know what the the cost i think it was maybe 15 to 20 dollars i imagine and so they came in perfect condition uh, it looked like to me that the figs were never even in a bad state whatsoever it looked like i had picked them right off my tree myself and so the whole experience just in general i, I have to say was amazing it's totally if, if he's selling these i'm not even sure if he is selling this experience but this experience here is easily worth 300 to 500 dollars in my opinion like you have no idea how amazing some of these figs are um and so we spend crazy amounts of money 300 people are buying fig trees nowadays still for crazy prices but to think about you know spending 300 500 a thousand dollars someone had spent i think on cuttings, I think it was, or was it a tree of Ponte Tresa years ago? Um, you know, I would rather spend some money and actually get to taste the fruits than buy a tree for that amount of money. I think if also if someone's willing to spend the money on a tree or cuttings, you should probably be willing to spend the money on the fruit. Um, anyway, that's just my own little opinion there. But um, so David, with these numbers that he has with all the figs, is that uh, it represents the location in which he found the fig. So he has found uh, over 1,800 different locations of figs in California. And he's got a nice little special arrangement with his job, and it's a lot of freedom, and he takes drives. And he's mapped out all the locations on this app. It's called Onyx, Onyx, so O-N-X, um, Hunt, I think it's called. And anyone can get this uh, this app, and you can document on the app real time the location that you're at, and then also photos and notes about each individual location and each individual fig. So in his map that basically he's created in this app, he's obviously documented them, numbered them, and then from that map, he's been able to kind of 
make an evaluation of where he should go next of finding some of these seedlings. And of course, then also from these seedlings, he's, um, you know, found some kind of like epicenter, some origin point. And it's just amazing what he's been able to do, him and his family, all of his family is a part of this and doing and finding these figs and documenting them. And so it's just great work. I, you know, I've been doing the same thing with just really this year, uh, this summer, I found about 50 fig trees in the Northeast, um, around Philadelphia, around the Jersey shore. And that was a lot of time, an incredible amount of time to think about the amount of time that he must have been spending on these figs and these seedlings. It's just insane. Um, you know, it took me many hours to just find and document and look at 50. So for him, I'm just, uh, again, thoroughly impressed. And it's important that he's doing this. You know, I think this is important genetics that obviously are disappearing every day. The ficus carica, the species ficus carica in California is considered invasive. And even the state is paying people to remove these figs. So there's a lot of like, just so much going on. And it's just important work, uh, even for myself and people us like us that can't find seedlings. I can't even grow seedlings unless I get some pollen. Um, you know, it's important for us to also go throughout the Northeast and find these old heirloom figs. You know, there's some definite value and we're going to find something I'm sure that's the next best greatest fig. And that's going to be important because one day that may disappear. Um, so anyway, he's found over 1,800 different locations. And at each location, if you think about it, there's patches of these figs. It's not just one fig. There's usually multiple seedlings in these locations. So he's probably found 5,000 to five, to 10,000. I can't remember what he said exactly of the, the number. But that's a ridiculous amount of figs to, be, to have documented. Um, I mean, that's probably, I would imagine how many seedlings you would have to plant and evaluate minimum to get something good. So he's doing, again, great work. And I, I just very thankful that him and his family sent me these varieties. So um, there is one other thing I want to mention uh, for those of us that are not really familiar with how f the fig wasp works and also what the fig wasp is and, and pollination and all that, but there's a specific wasp called the blastophaga that is specific to ficus carica that will pollinate different figs, male figs, and also female figs within ficus carica. And if I were to plant a seedling that was pollinated, um, or the, the female fig that I harvested the seed from was indeed pollinated, um, and I planted those seeds, I could potentially get myself some seedlings and those seedlings are going to be 25% of them a male capper fig. And those male capper figs are really just simply there to house this blastophaga, this wasp to provide pollen to then pollinate the female figs and the female figs. There's 25% chance that you can get a common fig, which doesn't require pollination. That's what I grow here. The Braba and the main crop do not require pollination. Um, there's also a 25% chance I can get a San Pedro type, which is something like Desert King, where the Braba doesn't require pollination, but the main crop does. Then there's also the Smyrna type, which is the other 25% of this puzzle. And that those figs typically don't produce Braba, and the main crop does require pollination. So it's pretty amazing. Um what the caprification also can do besides just pollinating the fruits because if if those figs the the san pedros the smyrnas if they don't get the pollination the figs won't even ripen at all so i have a, you know i've grown san pedros and smyrnas here in the past and without the fig wasp the figs just drop off the tree but the caprification itself also makes the figs taste incredible and it's not across the board but pretty much across the board the quality should increase um, it can affect the size which may be actually a bad thing 
it may also increase maybe the splitting, which could be a bad thing. Um, so there are some downsides to caprification, but in general, if you're going to pollinate some figs, the overall quality of the fruit should increase. And in some situations, depending on the variety, the flavors will be insane um, compared to what they were uncaprified or not pollinated. Um, so that's kind of the rundown here. I think I wanted to go through with you guys um, on the pollination, what David's doing, um, how this all this works. We Again, we can't grow them here. We, can't, we don't have seedlings popping up everywhere because if the birds were to eat my figs and poop out seedlings, the seeds were never pollinated. So I need to, what I need to do is actually get myself a male capra fig and hand pollinate the figs, which is very doable. You take the pollen from a male capra fig and then you basically store it before you're ready to use it. And once you're ready to use it, you take yourself a needle, a syringe, and you inject actually that pollen into the bottom of the at the bottom of the fig and you can hand pollinate them so you can actually grow figs here without the 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 blastophaga and still pollinate them um and it's something i think that's really not that difficult and it's something after this whole experience that i'm going to be doing without a doubt and after talking to a number of growers that are in california that you know, have been caprifying their figs for a number of years, there's no doubt in my mind, and especially in their minds as well, that if, if they were to move somewhere outside of an area without the fig wasp, they'd be doing the same thing. They'd be hand pollinating their figs as well. Um, so that's what we're going to do in the future. And that's, I think, really the next thing, the next really big thing in figs. And it really didn't dawn on me until I tasted David's figs. So let me go through this tasting now with you guys. Um, I was so blown away. I really didn't even know, honestly, what to expect. And we'll kind of see this as we go. But the first one here we're trying is called uh, Flosden. And this was by far the worst one. So we started off kind of at a low point, believe it or not. Um, and I really didn't know what to expect because... A lot of the pulps and a lot of what you see here just didn't seem like it, it was going to taste like whatever I looked at, it didn't look like that's what it was going to taste uh, or it didn't taste like what it looked like, excuse me. And that looks are very deceiving, I've realized, with these figs that are caprified. Um, you know, a fig like that, like this here looks like a very simple honey fig here that wouldn't taste good at all. And I would be very disappointed for the most part. But this I gave, I think, even though it was the worst one, a 3.8 out of 5. And this was a, actually a pretty darn nice fig. Um, so, you know, again, we're going we're gonna to kind of see that common theme as we go throughout this. But, again, that was flows in there. So the other thing what I like to do here, guys, when I taste figs is kind of what you would do with wine, right? You would, you know, get the wine in your cup and then you would smell it and you would figure out what it's going to taste like. And then you would taste it to confirm what you thought it was going to taste like. And the same thing I like to do with the figs. I look at the figs. I look at the pulp. I imagine what the flavor is going to be like. And then I eat it. And typically I can confirm almost always what it's actually going to taste like. And this was just a total 180, almost impossible to do because of this caprification. Um, but the outside area of the pit is a, a very interesting texture that I have not experienced before. So this one, even though the flavor wasn't great, the texture was I think that up there. Probably will go away as it ripens more. This is sort of underripe. Oh, wait. Actually, I think the – I didn't like the texture on that one. Okay. I would 
did that probably uh, 3.8 out of 5. This is a very flat fig, very round. So this one here was a total shock because look at the look at this fig. It just doesn't it doesn't look like much. You know, it's a small brown flat fig that you know, I would have thought maybe just bad vibes like from brown turkey but here's the inside David, come on now. and this is called corazon de la bahia which is 402 there you go insane so i'm just having a ball at this point uh i'm Realizing, I think, what I got myself into at this so point. Simple brown sugar fig. This is nuts, dude. This one had good blackberry flavor to it. The berry flavor is, um, not very sweet. Some of the best fix. So that this is definitely one of David's better finds. Alright, so that I would highly recommend people in Fig uh Figland. This one is uh, Morningstar seven twenty four. And this was a lot like a honey fig, but rather different. Um, best honey fig I ever had, if I'm not mistaken. That was this was a very interesting fig in my mind. I think I probably put it like a four, 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 five out of five. Some of them were a little bit less ripe. But it doesn't really matter because the climb is so perfect for David is. If I've never never experienced that before, I don't even know how to describe it, guys. I have to sit down and think Is about this one Brombery? Um, or is this Amen Citron? Okay. And the uh, inside, flies. look at that. Ooh. And the outside, you know, just really didn't look anything like it would look like this. Uh, look how simple and almost kind of boring that looks. And, um, again, just very deceiving. One of them had, I think, a little bit of um, spoilage. Probably a little bit more ripe than some of the others. Um, we also have a little bit of what the color that a little bit of not yeah. sweetness at all, but so much acidity. This one was extremely acidic. Weird balance of sweetness and acidity. Flavor to it. Um, sharper. It needs some sweetness, like it's almost too acidic without the sweetness. Not a good balance. So, as time went on, I was just so blown away by, like, how ridiculous some of these figs were. Like, again, they didn't seem like I was eating a fig. Some of the flavors were outrageous. Uh, the sugar flavors, the berry flavors, the figgy flavors, whatever it was. You know, it was just, it was just mind-blowing to me. There's some kind of berry flavor in that one I couldn't figure out. All right, so this is a new one here from from David. He just found this. Now, this fig didn't look like much, and if you look at it, probably doesn't look like it's got much of a berry flavor, but it did. Again, so... Me thinking to myself, it's not going to have a berry flavor. It's 
going to be more of a honey fig. <laughs> I said it's unbelievable. <laughs> it's an amber fig. There you go. So this was also one of my favorites. Wow. Highly recommend this one. Yeah, this one's really well uh, awesome. So far, the Corazon and the unnamed very, very 1845 are great. 4.8. The problem is with both of them, they don't. I don't think they're gonna do well here. They're both rather flat. At some point here, I just give up trying to describe this stuff. A pop tart. <laughs> All right. All right. So this one is the real to thesis. Seven twenty-seven. Quite a flat fig there. Kind of looks like De Ponte in a way, the Quartiera. But look at the inside. Ooh. That looks nice. There it is. I think this was one of my favorites as well. Let me, uh... So when you're, you know, from what you had thought at the time, I looked at the pulp and I said, holy shit. Oddly enough. But very thick pulp. Rich pulp. It's got like a really rich, some kind of extra richness to it. say it's more along the lines of a honey fig but it's not really even like a honey fig what I normally eat is a honey fig because the pulp's so rich the pulp's so insane that like I don't know alright let's try this other one here this one's called Damon's Citron I think as well like it's a hard, harder skin alright so this one's Amon's so Citron that looks pretty darn good. 455. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does look amazing. They're capified. And normally, I don't even really notice the citron. I don't like the skin on that one at all. That's a really tough. All right, so that one's losing some points there for the skin. The flavor was good and the texture was weird, but very interesting. Loose. All right, so this one here was probably the most interesting of them all. It's uh, Kaora Pluma, 277, because when you look at it, it reminds me of Verdino del Nord, which is a fig that I adore. Um, you can see there it has a very similar shape, and the interesting part about it is the where the neck attaches to the stem here, and the stem is basically rather fat and... This is typical of Verdino del Nord, and that's really a great way, I think, to identify it. Uh, it's just a great fig um, in general, and that stem, I think, kind of is what sells it for me. Obviously, the shape is very similar, which is the most important point. The colors all match, and then the eating experience is the same. Uh, look at the pulp. You know, it looks just like... Verdino del Nord. So this is so interesting in that if it is indeed Verdino del Nord, which would be a miracle, it'd be pretty amazing. That means somebody had to have planted it where David found it 
And then probably around that tree are all these Verdino del Nord seedlings, which would be rather interesting as well. Um, so pretty amazing. And here's where I'm kind of showing you guys my own tree of Verdino del Nord and showing you guys the stem. And I just think the stems kind of match up. It'd be pretty amazing if that if that was indeed Verdino del Nord. So here's where I eat it and really it tastes just like Verdino del Nord. The texture is very similar. But isn't that weird that, you know, if it was ca if likely caprified, I mean, doesn't have to be caprified, maybe it's not, but the fig that I receive from California, all of them are so amazing because they're caprified, but this one tastes exactly the same as what I grow here. And that just seems a bit weird. So I'm going to try to grow this fig at some point and compare them. We'll see what the deal is. Um, I try to get David for more information from him, but I got a video, um, a very quick video of it from him. And unfortunately, it didn't look as nearly as similar as I thought. The stem is really, really short. So I think there's probably a good chance it's not. But to be uh, just absolutely amazed that it's like so similar is just crazy to me. Now, this one's one of his best. It's called Jolly Rancher. And this is a great find. It really does taste like a Jolly Rancher. And I have to be highly, highly recommend that you guys try this one. Quite acidic. And uh, so in the future, I'm going to try this one as well. And, yeah, I mean, I have to really say that one's amazing. I don't know if I really sold it there in the video, but. Oh, here we go. A lot of these figs, like, you can maybe even say it tastes like a Jolly Rancher. <laughs> Here's what I'm losing my mind at this point of all the crazy flavors. And then the last one here was the 276 Cillin Dub, which is getting a lot of interesting attention because the pulp is rather black. And somebody had messaged me, as you can see here, this one's not as ripe as some of the others I've seen. But they said, hey, Ross, you know, that fig looks a lot like as dark, or it gets as dark as Black Celeste. So I was really impressed, caught my attention. And so... I hear I grow it, if or I hear I taste it, excuse me, and find out it's actually really good. Um, pro probably not as good as some of the others just because it was less ripe, but uh, picked another day later, it would have been, I think, amazing. And so this, I think, is also one of David's more interesting finds. In any case, guys, so that's kind of the, the tasting there. I know I went through that rather quickly, uh, but this video has been going on for almost 30 minutes. So, um, you know, I, it just, I think, at the end of the day, again, very grateful for what David has done to give me this experience. Uh, grateful that he's doing this. He's doing great work. I think you guys, if you made it to this point, check out David's website, thefighunter.shop. Um, I'm personally going to be trying, as I said, 277, 276, 270. I think the unnamed new find, 1845 and um, Corazon 402, they're really great varieties. But those I don't think could be could work here. Um, we don't know if most of these are common, so that's the other thing. But to me, it doesn't really matter because I'm going to be hand pollinating these figs anyway. Um, I'm going to be hand pollinating as much as I can learning about that. It's amazing what the fig wasp can do for the flavor. It's just an insane jump. And I don't know if I really spelled it out well enough. Um, you know, I'm kind of a little bit under the weather today, 
But I'm telling you, the enthusiasm in this tasting and this video just, again, was insane. And I, I was dumbfounded. At this point, at the video, at the end, I kind of gave up. And I was just like, I can't even put together uh, an ending. Uh, it was like another four minutes of me trying to make sense out of all of this. So in any case, guys... Also, check out, by the way, not just David work, David's work, but my own uh, at FigBoss.com. Hit that subscribe button, and we'll catch you guys for more videos, all right? Take care.